We attach ourselves to people that make us feel warm and welcomed. It helps build community and it helps our survival. If you have untreated trauma, it affects you on a DNA level, you can pass that onto your kids. So it's well worth getting your trauma sorted out. And I do my best to see that silver lining within every experience. The solution should be simple, but it's not because we're talking about culture change, talking about changing behaviours, we're talking about challenging identities. Zach, welcome back to the show, mate. Thanks, man. It's good to see you again. Yeah, yeah. So I think it was, what was it? It must have been three years ago since our last one. Actually, we did one about a year ago. I think it may have been for the dark blue. Yes. 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 It's been a little while since I've been on your show though. Yes. True. But yeah. So, I mean, I asked you just before where you are in the world, you're in, you're in Texas. So what's happening? So you're on a, you're on a a brewery tour of men's health. Well, yeah, man, that was actually uh, this past, past summer uh, in August and September, I went on a uh, 10,000 mile tour. I don't know what that translates to in kilometers, but uh, probably a million. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Sounds about right. Yeah. Uh, um, so yeah, it was about, I did, I did 10,000 miles over the course of two months and I drove all the way around the border of the United States doing a tour of the breweries that have already agreed to host men's groups within the dark blue. So, wow. That's so yeah. cool. That's Very so exciting. cool. What, so what, um, I suppose we just jump right into it. Um, what are you learning from men around the country? Are there any similarities or patterns, needs? Yeah, man. Um, quite honestly, the biggest thing that I have learned, and it sounds super simple, um, but I've been faced with it so many times where guys just want to be heard. Um, mm. They want to have permission to talk. Um, you know, they. I show up at these events and the, the moment that people learn that I'm there um, representing men's mental wellness, I have strangers walk up to me and tell me details about their lives that I would never expect to hear. Wow. Isn't that amazing? And what, yeah. what's, um, what do they feel is preventing them from being heard? Is it, um, unable to put words to feelings? Is it a stigma associated with, with conversation and vulnerability or yeah, what's going on? Honestly, I think a lot of it comes down to stigma, societal expectations, you know, Um, I mean, there's still this big kind of unwritten rule that men in, um, in our culture are supposed to provide and be strong, you know, and not have and not falter, you know, and not not be, um, uh, I guess, a source of, of, of stress in the, in the family unit or whatever. Mm. Um, and so we're supposed to be the fixers. Right. And so talking about our problems or admitting we have problems, I think can be really difficult because, um, admitting we have problems means that we have weaknesses and therefore we visually, you know, as far as everyone else sees, can't, we can't provide for our families in the way that we're supposed to, Mm. you know? Um, so it's a lot of, I think, unwritten expectations that we still hold on to, um, that's, we're never told directly for the most part, you know, but Mm. like our marketing and all of these different things involved in the things that we experience tell us that we're not allowed to be this or that. Right. Mm. Totally. Yeah. They're very, um, messages are very implicit, aren't they? You know, the whole kind of, um, you know, you throw like a girl or, you know, man up and, and, and I mean, people on the other side of the fence, you know, especially with the man up thing, you know, they might, you know, they might suggest there's some merit to it, but it's kind of like, I don't know if it's a man up thing. It's really just a gender neutral thing of we can all be better, but I don't think that saying, Hey, you need to be better actually does what it's attempting to do. But I think getting to the root cause of why we're not Mm -hmm. one of the, one of the lessons that I learn every day as a counselor, as a therapist is um, I believe anyway, maybe I'm biased because of, of the industry that I work in, but uh, people really are trying their best. I feel, and I, and I feel like when they're when when they're not achieving their goals, whatever it is, it, it, the blockage is actually more or less subconscious, or well, they're not really aware. It's implicit in their behaviour, but they can't really see it. Um, is that coming up for you as well? Um, yeah, I would say so. I, you know, I just it, uh, I think that we, in so many ways, just kind of push on, push on thinking that 
like I said, we're supposed to be one thing or another that we never mm. really check in with anybody as to whether that's what they expect us to be or not, you know? Mm. Um, and, it, you know, a lot of times the moment that we're honest with the people, the loved ones in our lives um, and tell them like, hey, I'm feeling like this is what I'm supposed to be for you. Is that true? Um, it opens up that, that door for them to be like, no, that's not what I need you to be, yes. you know? And so it's it's this like kind of cycle where we're like okay well i'm not allowed to talk about it and then the other person's like i wish they would talk about it you know <laughs> yeah. um, and it just it just continues on and um it builds up a lot of resentments and things like that and um it just it just perpetuates uh, that just all those all those implicit ide- implicit ideals that mm. um don't really exist <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so when you, when, um, these men are kind of opening up and talking, are they, um, are there specific areas in their lives that you're noticing that many of them are having problems with? Is it relationships? Is it sense of purpose? Is it health? Um, yeah, just very interested to what's coming up. You know, it's, it's a, a number of different things. I, th- I would say probably what comes up most often is um, relationships mm-hmm. um, and work, career. Yeah. That's what yeah. I experience a lot. And, you know, often health problems come up because of these other problems, mm. you know, um, and things, issues that continue in their, their workplace or in their, with their spouse or partner um, that aren't being resolved. And mm. so, you know, and, and it's that constant stress and worry about, you know, if I don't perform in whatever area of my life I'm struggling in, if I'm not performing in that, then I'm not good enough. And if I'm not good enough, then, you know, what's going to happen? Am I going to get a divorce? Am I going to lose my job? Whatever. And so, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of health, re- stress related health issues come up um, because a lot of guys are just trying to make it happen in ways that they're not necessarily prepared for, you know, they don't have mm. the tools for because they're not, they don't feel like they're allowed to ask for them. Mm. Mate, that's such a great point. It's, um, it's very true. I feel like, you know, health and well being, unless you're in the industry, but even then your profession is, you know, grounded in helping other people with their health and well being. But to me anyway, health is something that serves a function for us to, you know, actualize our, our main drives and goals. And I think for a lot of people, you know, relationships in their career, um, you know, obviously a lot of men from what you're saying, that is that, that, that numero uno. And when they're not really thriving in those areas, their health actually suffers as a consequence, but it's not health fundamentally that is their main driver. And what that really speaks to me about is, um, you know, that sense that, that calling that we can all have where we're, you know, we feel like we're born to do something or create something or be there for someone and Mm -hmm. our health um, actually helps us do that, but it's not the primary thing for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a really funny thing, isn't it? Mm. Very bizarre. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. It's like the, it's like the more our health suffers, the worse we are at doing all these things. Right. And so, um, I, it, it's a lesson I learned, honestly, when I was pretty young, I want to say I was probably 22, um, maybe 21, when I first realized that saying yes all the time to people and being a people pleaser in general, just to fulfill my sense of purpose, essentially, yeah. um, honestly, was doing so much more harm than it was good. Mm. You know, mm. um, and the moment that I started to learn to focus on my own personal well-being first was exactly when my life really started to turn around and thrive and my ability to help others just increase tenfold, you know? Totally. Uh, yeah. And so yeah. It, it's a lot, it's a much different experience when you can approach the world um, in a positive headspace and a positive physical space and, you know, wake up in the morning and be like, I feel good. I can help others feel good. <laughs> you know? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a very important thing, I think, to, um, you know, sort yourself out first or at the very least be on the path of sorting yourself out and then helping other people bounce ideas off you and go, oh, maybe I can do that. Maybe I can do this. And yeah, it's interesting. I mean, you've been doing this for quite a while now, you know, is it how enjoyable and fulfilling has it been for you to see it thrive in the way it has? 
Oh, man, um, it's inexplicable, honestly. Awesome. Um, you know, it's it's been three years now. We started almost exactly three years, actually. Uh, we launched the first podcast episode, and um, you know, it's, it has since become more focused on the nonprofit aspect and growing the the men's group network um, more so than the the podcast, which is something that we want to get back to um, focusing on more now that the men's groups are starting to grow. But um, regardless, it's like been the, just watching the process happen and watching everything <clears throat> unfold has just been um, a, a really beautiful and honestly bewildering <laughs> experience um, because it's, you know, I have, I have so many days. I mean, right, right now I'm essentially running it, running the organization by myself. Um, now I do have ambassadors now around the country at the different, the different locations, um, leading the men's groups, which is amazing. Um, but as far as the business itself goes, you know, I'm the only person, um, running it right now. And so I have days where I'm just exhausted and I'm discouraged and I, it just, it seems like nothing's going right. And, um, I, I, honestly question whether I'm doing the right thing pretty often, mm -hmm. um, in those moments when things just don't seem like they're coming into place. And then, um, all of a sudden I'll get a message from somebody talking about how much, you know, how much the into the dark blue has impacted their life, you know, or, uh, I'll get a response from a partner or a sponsor from somebody who wants to be a part of the, the mission and, help us make it happen. And, um, you know, just these little things that happen where I'm just like, Oh, okay. I am doing the right thing after all, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and it just kind of helps keep driving it forward. But, uh, but yeah, it's been, it's been a roller coaster to say the least, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> most, most days it's, um, it's everything that I was hoping it would be as far as, you know, leaving my for-profit career, working for, a you know, um, a corporate corporate job making money for somebody else, you know, uh, it's, it's much better. My, my quality of life is much better, you know, um, even though, even when finances are difficult and things like that, uh, I feel good when I go to bed because I know I'm doing the right thing. That amazing. Like it, you know, st stability is important, but, um, you know, the ability well, just the, the, the recognition of, to be doing something that is fulfilling, you know, mm -hmm. it's so much more important. I feel like we can, we can bear so much as long as we have that, you know, and it's, yeah. uh, it's phenomenal what people can do. And it also speaks to me just hearing you talk about the, uh, you know, the power of validation. I think, um, validation cops a lot in this day and age, cause it's like, Oh, you need to be doing it for yourself. And it's that very individualistic notion of, and you know, intrinsic drive and motivation is really important, I think, but Every now and then it's lovely just to hear that kind of, Hey man, you're doing a really great job. I'm like, Oh, I needed that today. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It makes a, I mean, I think in anything we do, just getting that recognition is really important to begin with. Um, it's, it's fulfilling to know that we're not just it, that we're actually fulfilling a purpose of some sort. Mm, mm. You know? It can be uh, knitting, <laughs> playing basketball. <laughs> it's so different, whatever that thing is for everyone, but it's a, yeah. you've got to explore. And, um, you know, I was saying this to a client just before you've got to try as many different wines as you can before you find out that you like Shiraz or Cab Set, yeah. you know, but you can't know that unless you try a shit ton of wines that you end up hating. Right. You know, I, I mean, honestly, it took me years to find Tempranillo. And the good wine, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's my favorite, but yep. it took me a long time, you know, through your twenties, it's like, you're doing all the experimentation and you're just like, ah, oh, I'll taste the fucking same. Yep. So I don't know why I'm doing this, but then you finally find the one, you know? Yes. Yes. <laughs> and that's a good Spanish wine, isn't it? Oh yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. That's really nice. That stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> I'll get, I'm came for a drink after this. It's only two o'clock. It's not the end of the world. <laughs> <laughs> what time is it there? Uh, it's actually, it's actually a uh, quarter past one. So I try to sugarcoat that a little bit just to give myself yeah. a little bit more of a, <laughs> <laughs> Hey man, it's five. <laughs> yeah. I, hey, I, for me, as long as it's afternoon, I'm good. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I'm out of bed. All good. <laughs> <laughs> so mate, one of the things that I wanted to ask you about today was, um, so because I think last time we spoke, you hadn't actually started on this tour mm -hmm. and it's amazing because obviously it gives you insights into many people around the country 
And then I think you could, you know, take into account cultural differences, things of that nature, different demographics, but roughly the fundamental first principle um, problems, needs, um, desires, uh, points, perspectives that you're hearing might be very similar, at least what you're finding, obviously those patterns across the country. Is yeah. it, how's it changing your perspective? Cause I know we can get very kind of echo chambery when we're in our own heads, you know, I'm worth or I suck A, B and C and that sense of community that, wow, you too can have a fundamental impact on the way we see ourselves. So I'd, I'd love for you to speak on that. Oh man. Um, you know, I, the last, especially the last year, probably two years has been, um, in a number of different ways has been a big, uh, growth, uh, time of growth for me. Um, and honestly, you know, hearing a lot of the stories from these guys has just been really inspiring. Um, you know, I, I come across all kinds of different guys who are kind of, some are kind of stuck in, in a certain place in life. They're stagnant, you know, um, and they're struggling with things that are, um, very much in their control. You know, um, a lot of times when it comes to career or um, relationships, there are a lot of things that are within our own control that we don't recognize or don't want to recognize. And so, uh, you know, that's something that's always it stood out to me for for a number of years, um, just recognizing in people uh, things that they want to change, but don't actually take the steps to change, you know. Um, and so, uh, you know, a lot of the, the growth for me over the last couple of years has really been trying to acknowledge the things within myself that I want to change to get to where I want to get, get to where I want to be. Mm. Um, and, and seeing these different, um, different personalities and different experiences and hearing about different experiences as far as, you know, some guys are stagnant, like I was saying, and some guys have really done so much to improve their lives as far as business or whatever, whatever it may be. Um, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of people who really do the work, you know, um, and just even internationally, like guys meeting guys like you, like, um, and a lot of these other connections that I've made through Instagram, oddly enough. Yeah. um, And this community that you and I both interact with, I think pretty, pretty frequently of people who are just really doing doing what they need to do to make their dreams happen and to follow their passions, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And so I'm constantly trying to compare, contrast those, those different mindsets and keep in mind like where, what, which mindset I want to remain in as much as possible, which is growth, right? I want to stay in that growth mindset. And so um, it's like seeing some, it's kind of like seeing somebody who has a health condition that you don't want to have, right? It's like, okay, well, if I don't want that health condition, then I need to make sure that I eat well. I need to make, make sure that I exercise. And so you, you have that visual, like that's, that's what I don't want to be. So what do I need to do to, to stay away from that? Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it, it's, so a lot of times I get these examples, you know, and it, it helps me kind of keep veering toward <laughs> the, the goals that I want to, to reach. Um, that's interesting. So you're actually using pain as a, and fear almost as a motivator in that way. Yeah. Yeah. To a degree, Mm. um, which, you know, sounds a little dark and selfish, but you know, um, but, but it works. That's it. That's it. But, uh, I mean, on top of that too, it's just, it's like, even in the midst of that, those contrasts, the, even the ones who are successful in reaching their goals want community. Yep. You know, um, they need that community. Um, and you know, I've, I've, I've had moments where I'm very, very lonely in doing this. And it's interesting to me because I'm building, trying to help people build community and make connections. And I have moments where I, I just feel very, very alone. Um, and so it's, it's like, okay, well, everybody that I'm working with wants, wants community. And that's the purpose here is to build community. And so it kind of helps also to force me in moments when I'm feeling down or worthless or lonely or whatever it is, or all of the above, uh, (laughs) kind of forces me into connection, you know, um, which has been a really good thing too. So, So, yeah, I was going to ask you what um, keeps you going in those dark times that, you know, beyond the sense of purpose, 
but you kind of alluded to it there. It's that, that connection is that people want it just as much. Cause I think Mm -hmm. we all, when we start out, you know, upon entrepreneurial journeys, um, there must be something within us that wants it too. You know, maybe it was our own pain points and what we're trying to build wasn't there for us when we need it the most, or Mm -hmm. we can see, I've just, I mean, I haven't come across, I could be very, very, very ignorant in this regard, but I haven't come across too many successful entrepreneurs that didn't have an issue either directly or indirectly affect them. You know, it doesn't have to be them themselves. Like, Oh, I made this bath plug because I could never, whatever it is, or my best mate couldn't, but there's gotta be some personal drive, you know, otherwise Mm -hmm. we're, and we're all kind of selfish in that way, but it's using that selfishness to help others as well, which is like a lovely little paradox, I suppose. It's like, I mean, it's like any superhero's origin story, right? Yeah. Like there's always something that affects their personal life that makes them become that good for the community (laughs) that they become. Um, And so in a sense, yeah, we all have an origin story and I would completely agree with that. Mm. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. True. Yeah. So mate, this is awesome. So you're in Texas now. So what's happening in Texas? Um, you know, I, I tend to mind my own business. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, you know, there's a lot going on in the world. Uh, and I feel like the, the best we can do is, um, do our best and do, you know, good in, in the ways that we know how. Um, and, and honestly, uh, like it, it's Texas is Texas, you know, um, the politics, aren't great, but politics really aren't great anywhere, uh, to be honest. (laughs) Um, and so it's, um, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm here with, uh, my, my family, my parents are actually here in in the town where I'm at. And so, um, just really been focusing on trying to spend some quality time with them, uh, right now, because it had been probably about seven, seven to nine years uh, since I had really spent a lot of time with them. Wow. Um, and so being, being back here and getting to spend some time with them has been really important. Um, and I'm grateful for that. Mm, um, yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. So, yeah. What um, about the, um, they like communities doing similar things there. Um, I know there's, um, Aubrey Marcus and his crew in Austin, they do a fit for service thing, which is a you know, okay. building community, helping people kind of, um, do with themselves first before they can help others. I think their, their motto was like, um, to be fit for service, you have to be, oh, I can't remember exactly what it is, but like fit for service, you know, suppose being fit for yourself or I'll, I'll put it in the show notes. I'm absolutely stacked <laughs> that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But are you using this time to um, work on business things and networks as well? Yeah. Um, I mean, so the thing is there's not a lot when it comes to networks, right? Networks of, of these things. So there's a lot of, uh, local organizations that are doing men's groups or things like that, but there's not a lot. Are you fighting? I saw you fighting Eon there. That was impressive. Yeah. I did that really well. Yeah. <laughs> True. You've, you've had some practice with that. Yeah, exactly. I got it down, squashed it down. <laughs> Dude, in all tired. honesty, what, looking at a computer actually makes me yawn. It's so weird. I've been trying to nut this out for ages because I did, um, um, obviously went online when everyone was in, in, um, in the pandemic and I would find myself yawning more and I, and then I read into it and it actually induces a kind of apnea screen watching. They've actually, there's a whole literature on it that when the more you look at screens, the more you hold your breath and what that's what yawning is. It's a kind of like reclaiming breath because we're in a deficit. Mm-hmm. So I'm every time I yawn, I try to take stock and go, okay, you need to practice breathing again, mate. You've, you've, you've forgotten that. But I, yeah, the literature is pretty fascinating on it. So, uh, yeah, yeah. no doubt. I, or I, mean, I just made that whole thing up and I'm just bored. Hey, <laughs> I'm joking. You know what? It sounds legit. I would believe it. So. Yeah, I'll find the paper because I read the paper. Okay. Yeah. Does it, do you think the blue light has anything to do with it? Like if you turn the blue light filter on, does I it- reckon you, so hang on, I'm just going to find oh. this for everyone listening. Zach and I are good friends, so we're just gonna we're just gonna let you in on our little uh, journey here. <laughs> a little uh, tangent, yeah. Excessive screen apnea. Let me see if I can find this literature. Yeah, while you do that, here we go. Oh, oh, you got something? Oh, I was just gonna say while you do that, you and I, you know, we've known each other now. What three years? Three, three years. years? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're talking fairly regularly at the same time. It's crazy. 
Uh, and it's awesome. Like, you know, halfway across the world from each other. And, um, you know, it's been really amazing just building, building relationship with you, mm. um, and seeing just like your personal journey too. Um, I just wanted to say that I've been really impressed with your, like your physical, physical journey and all that stuff. I've, I saw you on your, your training stuff recently your, yeah. <laughs> uh, and that, and it's, it, you're just, uh, you know, really having that balance, you know, and doing the things you want to do and staying fit and all that. It's pretty, pretty awesome. So, oh man, I appreciate that. Yeah. It's, uh, it's good. I really, I try to, um, I try to incorporate a lot of that physical element to it. I'm, I'm right into jujitsu at the moment. So that's been my thing. Oh, nice. So that's mm. been, yeah, look at this. So screen apnea alters your body's delicate balance of gases like oxygen, nitric oxide, and carbon dioxide. This can cause inflammation, interfere with your immune system's ability to fight infection. Um, also scholarly articles for ex- excessive screen apnea, a survey screen for prediction of apnea, Clinical and societal consequences of obstructive, no, that's sleep apnea. Uh, screen, here we go, stop the questionnaire. The practical approach to screens for obstructive apnea. That sounds yeah. really cool. It's I, terrifying. <laughs> it, absolutely, especially since most of us spend so much of our lives on screens now. Yeah, um, that's right. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, if you, if you could, if you could send me that link, that'd be great. I would love to read that whole thing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So the, the big one here, this has been, um, so um, I don't have my journal login, um, but two of the major journal articles that just come up is physical inactivity, sitting time and screen time associated with obstructive sleep apnea in, a, in adults, a cross-sectional study, and then also caffeine and screen time in adolescents associations with short sleep and obesity as well. So there's a lot. And I think you think about how let's just, let's just really take this tangent <laughs> to the extreme here. <laughs> yes. If All you're, right. if you're on your screen and you're on there for half an hour and you're scrolling and you're constantly getting these kind of what Andrew Huberman talks about, these kind of novelty switches. Mm-hmm. So it's like the dopamine, right. That comes along with. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's a little amount, but it's just enough to be relatively more exciting than doing nothing. So I think that's, what's like important for people to understand here because dopamine, everyone's like, Oh, you're getting a dopamine hit and it's, you sort of, so you you do get a dopamine hit. Now this is coming straight from my psych science degree, but you get a dopamine hit. It's not like a dopamine hit though. It's not like you just get a one for one. You go on the screen, Mm -hmm. you get a dopamine hit it goes away. You get dopamine hit and it goes away. What it actually does is it gives you a new relative baseline and it makes other things that were relatively less exciting, more dull as a result. So Mm -hmm. it actually becomes harder and harder for us. And we get attuned to being less mindful, more scattered because these phones make us more scattered. And now mate, in clinical practice, everyone comes along and they they talk about having ADHD and some people (laughs) that is a real thing, like for sure. For the mm-hmm. vast majority of us, we live in an ADHD eliciting society. Oh yeah, we just lack willpower. Well, <laughs> I don't know, man, because like on on one side of me, so one side of me thinks so. There's a really good book called Stolen Focus, and Johan mm-hmm. Hari spoke about how personal things that you can do to pull yourself up by bootstraps, so to speak. You can meditate more. You can put your phone away. A, B, and C. They're really good and they shouldn't be disregarded. But when the society at large actually functions around these tools and technologies, mm-hmm. it's very hard to just simply, no, I'm not going to do that. Right. And do you know what's really scary about that, I think, is um, when you think about what happened in, in, in Nazi Germany when the vast majority of people ended up believing an ideology that was just absolutely, unbelievably torturous and terrifying. Right. It's so it's, far off base. From, it's so yeah. far off base. But if you think about what it would take to um, to stand against that, it's a bunch of individuals working mm. their way up to go no, and then obviously the power of the masses becomes, and that's what we need to do a hundred percent. But right. you also want to make sure you understand why it happened, and also when when you've got this thing in societies, you know, billions of dollars of marketing going into making these tools addictive. Mm-hmm. Our whole society, I don't know, mate, if it wasn't for Facebook, I don't think I would have been invited to an event for the past 10 years. No one sends out a fucking <laughs> mail anymore. Right, right. Yeah. So it's like you kind of have to just play along with these things and do your best, but we're all so addicted and it's, I don't, I don't know, like 
I, w- I would feel like I'm just perpetuating the issue if I said to a client, oh, you know, meditate more because it's like, well, yeah. I'm, I'm addicted. Like, I, you know, it's, yeah. this is what these things are like. Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, it, you know, we, uh, it's, balance is really important in my life, right? I'm trying really hard to maintain balance. Um, I had a long period of time where I was just like, no, I'm not getting on social media. I'm not, you know, getting on TikTok. I'm not doing this, that, whatever. Um, but you know, starting a business and realizing, right. okay, well, if I don't get on these things, then my business is not going to thrive, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, and so it's like, it's like, okay, well, where do we find the balance? And it's just like anything, just like with alcohol, just like with drugs, sex, whatever, where we need to be aware of our consumption, right? And I think that's that can be the hardest part because of those constant dopamine hits. And we just constantly keep needing more and more and more to stay there in that place. Um, and so, yeah, it's like finding that balance and disconnecting, going out in nature, leaving your phone at home, leaving it in your car and going for a walk, whatever. Um, and staying connected to uh, the natural things, right, is just so important. Um, did yeah. you ever read Brave New World by chance? Love that. It's my favorite book okay. of all time, so, literally of all time. <laughs> it's amazing. That one and 1984 are both yeah. like really up there for me. Um, but in Brave New World, uh, the character that's kind of ostracized himself from society mm. and doesn't want to participate in the things that are going on, right, in, in society, um, and then the self-flagellation and all that stuff to keep yeah. himself, like, grounded, right? Um, and so it, it's like those are two extremes in that book, and that kind of shows that, you know, that if you want to go to the extreme of denying all of the things all of, uh, de- denying the direction that society is going, um, then, okay, do that. But you have to be willing to accept the consequences of, of doing that. Totally. Um, and so, so yeah, it's like, for me, ever since I read that book, I, I am constantly trying to find where that, where that in between is. Mm. Mm. It's a very interesting point you make. And, you know, if I think about, um, our evolutionary underpinnings. We're, we're wired this way because everything was just so scarce. And it was like the extreme of a dog eat dog world, you mm-hmm. know, where, you know, sugar was a strawberry that you might get once a year or something like yeah, that. Yeah. And it was just wonderful because it was f- like just absolutely full to the brim of, of, uh, of energy, sugar, mm-hmm. glucose, you know, yeah. and now, We've built a world where, I mean, credit to us, we've built a world, at least in the West, where, and in the vast majority of the world, for sure, because you look at the stats in Africa and just how much of that place has changed, you know, there's there's the fact that more people are dying from obesity, from hunger, is a win, a massive win, because we've got far too much now. But <laughs> yeah. now you're exactly right, that, that balance. but And the balance is really hard, I think, because we're wired to see a scarce environment, but there's mm. not much scarcity anymore, at least in terms of biological needs. So it's like, now we need to use our individual cognition to, to wind it back. It's very, very difficult because we we're carrying around 210 million years of evolution. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. And just survival and trying to make sure that we, we have what we need, you know? Um, but I think a lot of it is we think we need things we don't need now as well. Yes. You know, we, we, the line, the lines between needs and wants have become very blurred. Mm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Do you, do you get a lot of people that you, you're talking with that struggle with addiction issues and, and things of that nature? Uh, yes, actually. Mm. Uh, you know, it's alcoholism is real, man. Um, it is. you know, there are so many people who, um, you know, alcohol is so accepted as just like a normal thing, right? Um, we don't we we don't classify alcohol on a wide, like, wide range as an as a drug, even though it is a drug. Um, and so, and it, and again, it's around the marketing, it's around the money, right? And it's telling us you need this, um, you know, you need this to be popular, you need this to feel good, you need this for whatever reason. 
Um, and so we're just like, yeah, I need that. And so yeah. it's, <laughs> you know, um, people go, people go to these breweries and, um, they drink far more than they need to, you know, instead of having one drink or two drinks or whatever. Um, and I think a lot of people are maybe social addicts where are in social settings, they, they'll just binge um, and not consider themselves addicts because they're like, Oh, I only drink when I'm around friends or I only drink on Friday or Saturday nights. But, you know, um, you know, it's, it's more about the, the consequences outside of those times, right. Um, whether it's money or relationships or whatever it might be, um, where, you know, we make the excuse and we're just like, Oh no, it's just on Friday night, Saturday night. And then, um, you know, we end up getting in fights with our, with our spouses or we end up getting in, you know, fights with strangers who don't really make no difference in our lives um, yeah. and going to jail for punching somebody because we had one too many shots, you know? Yes. Um, so yeah, definitely a lot of, a lot of addiction stuff. And I think a lot of people who maybe don't realize they have addiction issues, um, even if it is maybe a like situational addiction. And, you know, I've realized that there's like chemical addiction, people who truly struggle with, you know, chemical imbalances and, you know, um, like a, a disease in a sense of addiction. And I have friends who um, have that, that problem. Um, and then there's also people who it's just, it's situational addiction. I like to call it where, you know, they, they turn to um, they turn to overusing things that make them feel good because they don't, they're not making the necessary steps to get to a place in their lives where they want to be, mm, mm, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. And there's subtle um, behavioral changes, I think, as well. I think um, I was going to get back to that point um, before we got into the screen apnea stuff, but um, <laughs> it's the, come full circle, man. <laughs> it has, it has come full circle. Yeah. Why don't we? Why don't we just take it there? You mentioned before um, how you've changed as, as a result, and I'd love to take you back to you know day one um, to see if we could kind of um, you know build a connection with others who might be there at the moment that first step forwards, A, if you don't mind, where were you? Um, and was it a process of figuring out where you wanted to be and then reconciling the two? Or was the first step just, I think I really need to do this. So I'm going to do this first or yeah. What did, what did your journey look like? Oh man. Um, yeah. I mean, there's a lot to that. And I, I, you know, I've been looking forward to our conversation so much because, uh, you know, the depth of these conversations are the types of things that just really fuel me. Um, and you know, your questions are always very thoughtful and I love that. Um, and so, uh, anyway, I, you know, I was at a, in a pretty big transition point in my life, uh, when all this whole thing kind of started, uh, I've always wanted to help I've always wanted to make a career out of helping others. Um, it's just always been more fulfilling to me than chasing money or, you know, whatever. Uh, my, my main focus in life has always been to help improve the lives of others in some way or another. Um, and so when I, you know, and I've told this story a few times, but it's, uh, basically I, 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 a long relationship was coming to an end. Um, and so my, my ex-wife and I had, you know, divorced when I was 30 and I left the church life behind, which was a huge transition for me. Cause it's all I had known my entire life. Um, and so, and then, you know, that, that rom romantic relationship was about a third of my life at that point, <laughs> uh, yeah. which is pretty significant. Yeah. And so, you know, I was, I was basically starting fresh and moving, moving up from Texas to Seattle, Washington as a manager for Amazon. Mm. And I worked with Amazon for several years and just got to a point where I was just not living my best life. I was, I mean, I was doing some great things. I was traveling. I was getting to, to go a lot of places that I hadn't, I wouldn't have been able to go otherwise. Um, and traveling really helped to start with a lot of perspective shifts for me. Mm -hmm. Um, but even after all the travel and, you know, making some decent money with Amazon, I just got to a point where I was just feeling just, just kind of sad all the time. <laughs> um, and just really unfulfilled, uh, mm -hmm. waking up before work just every day, just saying to myself out loud, I don't want to do this. Wow. And it was just every day. I don't want to do this. I can't, 
I don't, I don't want to go to work today. I, maybe I should call in. I just, I don't know if I can do it. And so there was just a lot of pressure and a lot of uh, expectations in that job um, that just weren't feeding me in any way um, because all of that pressure and expectation was based in making money for somebody else. Yep. Right. Even though I was making okay money, it wasn't great, but it was okay. It was better than I had ever made before. Um, there were a lot of people making a lot more money than me because of the work that I was doing. Sure. You know, um, and because of the work that the, my, my employees were doing, which was an even bigger, had an even bigger impact on me, you know, because seeing, seeing people, humans being treated like machines to make money for, you know, somebody else to, you know, have robot dogs and, um, go to space or whatever. <laughs> um, the, it, it was just really depressing at the end of the day. And, yeah. um, so I realized I needed to make a change and it was time for me to finally get back to the nonprofit world. Um, yeah. and so I, I hit a really difficult moment in, uh, about December of 2019, and that led me to leave my position with Amazon in January of 2020. And uh, I've never looked back, even though it was probably the worst timing ever. <laughs> um, but I, yeah, I've just never looked back. And it was just, you know, earlier in 2019, when we started the podcast, I was like, I told my, my buddy that we started, that started it with me. I was like, look, I want this to be a career for me. I was like, just so you know, I am not going to hold back. I'm going to push forward as hard and fast as I can. Um, and he was just like, okay, cool. And so we got it going. And um, that's, that's been kind of my philosophy with the whole thing is just every day take steps forward. And yep. even if they're small ones, it just helps you get to that goal. And so um, that's, that's kind of what got me here. Mate, that's a great, I appreciate you sharing. And, you know, I think um, one of the things to, to listen from, to, from that story, I think is that, you know, you think about pain being a motivator. It's not necessarily, you can use pain in so many different ways, but just the very fact that we're motivated neurochemically by both pain and pleasure. And when you abstract that out to pain being having enough money to survive and then you burn the boats so you can't row back, you know, mm -hmm. that, yeah. that gives you enough motivation to get out of bed because it's not motivation of, Oh, here we go. I'm ready to go. It's like, if I don't, there will be no bed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I yeah. don't think that's like, you know, that can really help um, that insight. You know, I wouldn't necessarily get people just to, you know, drop them in the middle of the Pacific ocean and, you know, figure <laughs> out, try to find a, trying to find an Island. But right, right. this is where responsibilities can come in to actually give you that that just that relative amount of on, or even though I don't feel like it, I've got to, mm -hmm. I've actually got to. And um, the most important thing is that whatever you've decided to do and work hard to do, it has to be fulfilling enough so that you don't start resenting yourself from having <laughs> those, those pains and yeah. pleasures as, as motivations. But um, that's an interesting story. Cause that was about the time you and I, I think started connecting. It was around, it would have been late, late 2019, perhaps, if not early to 2020, I think. Yeah, I think it was, I think it may have been, I think it was actually like mid 2019, maybe late 2019, but yeah, it was yeah. around that time for sure. Yeah, true. Um, so yeah, definitely. And there was, I mean, there was a lot, a lot happening at that point, <laughs> um, you know, um, and yeah, the, I mean, the culture, the culture in the job that I was in was basically just like work hard for 12 hours and then for four days and then drink for three days, drink and sleep for three days and then go back and do it again. <laughs> yes. Know? And that was, that was literally the circle I was in. Um, and every night after work, we would, all the managers would get together and go, go have drinks. And, yes. you know, and it's, it's like, this is, what is this? What am I doing? <laughs> um, and so, uh, anyway, yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't, I, I want to, make it clear that I didn't just quit my job, uh, and, you know, completely unprepared. I mean, this was something that I had been preparing for, for 
a while and finally got to that point where I was, I had, you know, the finances I needed to, to be able to survive for a little while while I got this thing started and everything. And so, um, (laughs) just everyone should be aware that you don't, you can't, you shouldn't just drop everything and just do it on a prayer. Like you're going to be okay. Um, (laughs) it definitely takes some preparation and some, like you said, responsibility in, in, um, in, going in this direction, but definitely identifying that passion and what's going to actually fulfill you is the first step toward that. Yeah. So. And mate, you mentioned that you left the the church. What do you, do you still have a, a spiritual connection nowadays or is it, is it in the community and work you're doing or what does that look like for you? Yeah, mostly that. I mean, I, I am the type that I still believe in God. I think that there's some force driving us. I, I don't think that um, coincidence to me, coincidence just doesn't make sense. Um, I, I just, I, I think that there's more at play than just oops. <laughs> um, and all of this stuff has now been created because of, because of an accident. Um, sure. You know, uh, does that God look like a man in the sky with a white beard? Probably not. <laughs> um, It'd be but, so weird if it was like, oh, you're actually a man with a beard yeah. in the sky with white stuff on. That's very weird. <laughs> you know, maybe that's where the story of Jack and the Beanstalk comes from. Yeah. Maybe there is a giant in the sky. Yeah. Um, <laughs> with a beard wearing white clothes. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, but yeah. So, I mean, it's just that there's a lot of things, a lot of connections that I made through religion um, and consistencies in other, in multiple religions that made me to, to get, got me to a point where like, yes, I believe that there is a God. I believe that there's a force there an energy there that is driving things uh, in a sense. Um, but, uh, uh, and even historical, historical characters, I believe existed, you know, <laughs> I, I, and I believe that a lot of these stories are, are true. Um, and some are allegory, you know, um, but all of these prophets and everything that we've, we learn about in different religions, I believe, absolutely existed yeah um so um did they all have connections to different gods maybe not um you know maybe they all had connection to the same god and called it a different name yeah um <laughs> yeah i don't know but uh but yeah so i mean i find a lot of spirituality in in people around me in nature um in just learning to understand the world deeper um and simultaneously the simplicity of it yeah you know yep. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Mate, there's a um, YouTube comment that I've never forgotten. And I, I used to watch a lot of debates between atheists and, and religious individuals. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was a comment had so many likes. I've never seen a comment have more likes because it, it just some summarized perfectly, in my opinion, anyway, the perennial debate and where, yeah. where they both lie. And uh, it was like atheists say they're meaningful narratives Mm -hmm. but they're still narratives or they're meaningful fictions, but they're still fictions. And the the religious people say they're meaningful narratives, but they're still meaningful. So Mm -hmm. I love that because it's like one person sees the fiction in the allegory and the parable and the story. And the Mm -hmm. other person sees just how fundamentally important those stories and narratives are for our way of being. Mm -hmm. And I find myself on that narrative side. I love narrative therapy. I love understanding people's stories that they tell themselves, things of that nature, you know, whereas other people probably just see a more objective universe and they go, but I also understand how the stories that we tell ourselves help us. But at the end of the day, it's still all just subatomic particles and who knows what the (laughs) hell quantum mechanics is and things of that nature. But it's interesting how how we all see it. Yeah, it really is. Um, what about you? What's your perspective on spirituality? Oh, mate. Uh, for me, for me, it's, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a word that means many things for different people. Um, for me, it's a connection to self. I think just a connection, mm-hmm. um, to, um, who I am. And for me, actually, to be honest with you, if I'm just going to go super internal, it's always having awareness of, um, death. And mm-hmm. if I, you know, compare every interaction, uh, you know, with people and how I conduct myself based upon how I look back on my life when I'm 
you know, on my deathbed, mm. hopefully I'll be guided in the right way. And um, yeah. I think that because I can be inundated by the thought of what happens when we die and, and, and everything like that. And that's why I love reading all the stories and the Bhagavad Gita was a, had a massive impact for me. Um, but I think to try to keep myself sustainable, <laughs> yeah. I just try to think, okay, my, if, if, you know, if today was the day that I was going to die, um, w- would this be the right way to conduct myself? And, you know, mm. I, I tell myself that similar story in many forms. Yeah. One thing I try to do was, is ask myself, um, you know, was I a good housemate to live with today with my fiance, you know, or yeah. like, was I a good, um, friend, you know, cause sometimes in a relationship, you need a friend. Sometimes mm-hmm. you need a, a romantic partner, you know, sometimes you need a housemate. <laughs> what the hell are you <laughs> done with these chores? So I try to like compare myself across these dynamics. Um, yeah. The other main thing as well, in terms of my spirituality connection to myself is like always trying to remember that it's never my job to fix anyone as a therapist, mm-hmm. but to get to know them. Um, and to, because their motivations might be very different from mine and it's, um, and yeah, but I think it's as far as the religion goes, I love just learning about all the stories that people mm-hmm. have told their societies and communities for thousands of years, because, yeah. uh, if you get down to that first principles aspect, to me, it starts to be very clear as to what all guides us all like, you know, so I've obviously just gone a complete 180 on what I just said, which is we're all motivated by different things in the micro, (laughs) but in the macro as human beings, human Uh nature, growth, love connection. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I mean, there's many layers to everything, you know, um, that's, that's one of the things that always has really struck me about Buddhism. I love Buddhism because it's, it, it's so founded in, um, you know, under understanding your core as a self and how that core interacts with the rest of the world, yeah. you know, with the world around you and the whole idea of interdependence and all of that. And so it's like, yes, you have that core level, but then it's like understanding, like you said, was I, was I a good person at the end of the day, if I died today, you know, would my, and would my actions have affected anybody negatively, yep. you know? Yep. Yeah. Um, definitely. So they're all tied together. Mate, the, the Buddhist four noble truths is so cool. I just reckon mm-hmm. number one, there's heaps and heaps of fucking suffering in life. <laughs> number yep. two, suffering comes from the fact that we desire shit. Number three, <laughs> well, that means that if there are less desires, then there's less suffering. Number yep. four, here's a path to show you how to do it. <laughs> so good. <laughs> yep. Yep, exactly. And you know, that, that perspective shift on attachment is just such an important thing. Yeah. You know, um, it's like there are, our, our human, our human brains are just like, we want to hold on to things so tightly. Mm. You know, we want to hold on to our, we want to hold on to our beliefs. We want to hold on to our possessions, our, you know, people in our lives, you know, whatever, whatever it is, we want to hold on to it so tightly. And, um, it's like, it, it's, it, you know, when you hold something, when you, when you grip something too tight and you have like fingernail indentions in your hand, mm. you know, you're holding on to it so tightly that you're actually causing yourself suffering. Totally. Totally. Right? Yeah. And you don't realize it until you let go and you're like, Oh shit, I almost, cut myself with my fingernails, you know, or whatever. Yes. And it's like, Oh, the whole time you're just like, Oh, well, maybe if I just cut my fingernails, I would reduce my suffering. Yes. Um, you know, um, but, but yeah, it's, it's just all about that learning how to, how to detach from things. And, um, it took me a long time to learn about, um, like how deep attachment really goes. Yes. Um, and it's not just these surface things. It's not just our possessions. It's not just our relationships, but it's also yeah. just these, these negative beliefs about ourselves and about others. And it's, there's, you know, there's just so much more to, um, to attachment. That, so uh, true. I just, yeah. It's, it's an, end, it's an endless game. That one it's, you know, down in the, in the practical, it's like when someone says something that I don't agree with, how many seconds of discomfort can I put up with just sitting there before mm. I, before the person that I'm addicted to being ends up saying something and I, I sympathize with people who are addicted to their suffering as opposed as, you know, I mean, we all are to a degree. I'm certainly not in line. I'm far from it. Um, Alan Watts said that, but we're, you know, we're addicted to our suffering. I never understood that. Um, and then um, I read 
Becoming Nobody by Ram Dass. And he would always talk about how, you know, it's so terrifying not to be a someone because if we're not a someone, then what are we? You know, mm-hmm. his thing was loving awareness, but for people in the, in, you know, in, in terms of being a, a kind of practical concept to, to wrestle with, we are what we do, you know, over across time. And the moment you stop doing, doing those things, it's like, well, now I have to deal with. This kind of, yeah, that's it. Uh-huh. Well, it's like, what's the shit that's, what's this nothingness that arises yep. this existential uh, pain, you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's a very, very scary concept, but I've, I've always been interested in identity. And, you know, I think for you going back to your story, end of a relationship, end of a job, crazy identity shifts, end of spirituality, man, they're like the big three. So to, to be <laughs> swimming in that ocean without any kind of Island to stand on is, is crazy. Like it's so yeah. good that you navigated it, you know? Yeah. You know, I, I, I gotta be honest. I, I think that that is something that everybody should go through at some point in their life. I agree. Um, is, is just to be left with nothing. Um, you know, I, I had, I had just moved to a new place with no friends, no family. I mean, I obviously I had long distance support of my family and things like that, but as far as like actually having somebody to go to at the end of the day and be like, ah, today really sucked or, you know, whatever, Mm -hmm. it it just wasn't there, you know? Um, and so it's, it, it, it did, you know, there were nights where I, just went home after work and laid in the dark by myself and watched movies for hours. Um, and it was very therapeutic in a sense, but, um, you know, uh, it, it was also balanced with days out hiking in the mountains and going snowboarding and things like that mm. and doing all these things by myself, which is something that I hadn't done in a decade, wow. you know, yep. uh, really taking that time to focus on myself and, um, and really just come back to my core, you know, totally. Totally. Uh, and, you know, I think that's, that's a lot of it is that like, we all have this core self, right. And these layers just build up on top of that core self of, of disappointments and frustrations and um, like identity things that people tell us that we're supposed to be and yep. not be in this and that, and those things build up and they just create this facade that yep. isn't real. You know, it's not, it's not who we really are. And so, mm-hmm. um, you know, getting, being at a point where you are left with, with nothing and having to, to rebuild, uh, in a sense or deconstruct maybe, yeah. um, is, is something that's just so it's, it's, it's essentially kind of like an, an ego death, you know, um, it is by, by <laughs> definition. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's, it's just a necessary thing, man. And I'm, I'm honestly grateful for that time in my life as difficult as it was in the moment. Mm. Um, it, it, uh, has brought forth a lot of positive changes. So I absolutely, I, I try to tell, um, you know, people that, that the whole thing about when, when they say, cause you alluded to it so, so well, just then, you know, I think, when you're trying to find yourself and, you know, set course for a vision for your life and a, and a sense of purpose, it is there. It's just that over the course of the years, every time someone told you that you weren't good enough or put a limiting belief mm-hmm. or you, there was a trauma or some suppression of an aspect of yourself to meet the love and validation of someone else. That's a, that's a brick on that path mm-hmm. and it builds and builds and builds and builds and builds. And then all of a sudden there's a brick wall so it's no wonder that you can't see the way forward because there's a giant brick wall of everyone else's shit right in front of you. <laughs> yeah. But as soon as you yeah. go, as soon as you have that massive breakdown and there's tears everywhere and you go, this is enough. I'm just so sick of standing behind this wall. You take a brick off and it mm. feels a little bit lighter and you yep. cry. You take a brick off, you exercise, you move friendship groups, you start a new job, you start dating people you're actually interested in. And then all of a sudden you start to see the forest and the sun and the kangaroos jumping around everywhere. And you go, Oh my God, I can't believe I couldn't see you guys. You know? And then all of a sudden, well, now I've just got to walk on the path that was always meant for me. Yep. Absolutely. So I, I'm actually, I'm really jealous that you can see kangaroos jumping everywhere. <laughs> um, Look, the irony of that is I just ate kangaroo for lunch. So. <laughs> 
<laughs> it was great as well. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've always wanted to try kangaroo. I've heard it's really good. Good. Very healthy for you. Very healthy. Yeah. Can be a bit chewy, but uh, very healthy for you. <laughs> Pretty lean, right? Kind very like lean. Very lean. Yep. Yep. Okay. That's crazy lean. Yeah, no, it's good. Well, mate, it's always a pleasure um, chatting to you. Is there anything coming up for you with the um, the organization that you wanted to to briefly talk about? Um, you know, honestly, it's just, we're, we're just building this network, man. We've got now, uh, 12 men's groups that are going to be up and running, uh, by this next week, actually the beginning of May. Um, and so we launched in March, we launched nine of them and, uh, here in May, we're going to be launching, uh, two, three more. And so, um, you know, it's just moving along and I'm just super grateful for the support and, um, seeing people just really embracing, uh, men's mental wellness, you know? Um, and so that's really where we're at as an organization right now is growing that. And so, you know, finding new host breweries and ambassadors. And I mean, we're honestly looking at hopefully by 2023 going to, going to the UK. And so Uh, what happens there. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, you know, it's, it's a, it's a process, but nothing, nothing huge coming up, you know, it's all very small steps right now that that are, that are happening. And so, um, yeah. That's awesome. Well, mate, yeah, thank you so much again for the for the work you do, and it's always a great um, conversation when when we get to connect online. And um, yeah, just always always uh, admire watching you watching you grow. So it's great. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. Um, and uh, do you mind if I if I like plug our info real quick? Of course, please. Let's do it. Go for it. Cool. Um, yeah. So I mean, if you guys want to check out more about what we do, just go to uh, www.intothedarkblue.com. Um, and you'll find everything there, our mission purpose, um, podcast even is there. So if you want to listen to, I've actually got a, a couple interviews with, with Tom here. So, uh, check those out. And, um, yeah, so there's a lot of good stuff there. And, mm. um, also if anybody's interested in sponsorship stuff, we do have a Patreon and all of that. So I'm definitely glad to provide that information for, um, the notes and everything. And it's yeah. also on the website. So. Uh, we are a nonprofit in the United States and uh, just, you know, trying to get off our feet, get on our feet, uh, not off our feet, get yeah, on our feet. Off the ground. And <laughs> get off the ground. Yep, exactly. Um, and, and just make this happen, you know, so it's pretty exciting stuff. It definitely will, mate. It's just a time thing. So into the dark blue. Yeah, I'll have that in the show notes. And um, yeah, mate, we'll talk soon. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Guys, speak to you next week. Bye.